Hello and welcome to the webinar on meeting weather challenges in the western U.S. Organic practices to mitigate and prepare for climate change. This webinar is part of the Organic Farming and Soil Health in the Western U.S. webinar series organized by the Organic Farming Research Foundation and eOrganic with funding from Western SARE. I'd like to welcome back Mark Schoenbeck who has presented all the webinars in this series. Mark is a research associate at the Organic Farming Research Foundation, and he's worked for 31 years as a researcher, consultant, and educator in sustainable and organic agriculture. We also have Megan Simmons of the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory with us, who will be available to answer questions during the question and answer time. She is a soil and ecosystem biogeochemist, modeler, and data scientist who works to ensure the long-term sustainability of ecosystems by informing best management practices, decision-making, and policy. So welcome, Mark and Megan. I'm going to hand the remote control over to Mark now, and as a reminder, just click on the PowerPoint to take control. Okay. All right, well, thank you everyone for joining us. and. Um, I just want to say something about how this presentation uh, is set up. The first part is more general overview of climate and agriculture, how they affect each other, and some general outlines of how organic and sustainable practices can improve resilience to climate extremes and in some cases uh, help mitigate uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And I want to save time to go into a little greater depth and some research into um, that has been conducted in the Western region on the specific challenges that both the existing climate and the climate changes are presenting farmers with. Uh, so there are a lot of notes that will be posted along with the archived webinar. So if you want to learn more in depth or check references and some of what I say during the first half of this presentation, uh, that's a place that you can go. Okay, thank you. Let's get started. Oh, I click the other side of you know, click the left side of your mouse. Yeah, there you go. Oh, there we go. All right. Okay, so um, how is climate change impacting organic agriculture? Um, you all probably know a lot more about this than I do since I've been sitting here in balmy Virginia. Um, the rain still comes down 12 months a year, um, not constantly. Um, anyway, um, I like to start these webinars with looking at the findings of the National Organic Research Agenda uh, published by uh, Organic Farming Research Foundations based on a survey of organic farmers across the nation in 2015. Um, at this time, there were 555 farmers from the Western region who participated, responded to the survey. And in addition, there were six listening sessions held within the region. And uh, this survey was conducted right at the time when the uh, California drought was approaching its worst. It had been uh, excessively dry for four years and was beginning to set records. So that gives a backdrop as to uh, what was on farmers' minds. Uh, soil health as across the nation, uh, but it also in the Western region, was rated as high priority by the largest number, 71% of uh, respondents. And some interesting areas that they want to explore further is practices to uh, sequester organic carbon in the soil. And also are there ways that farmers can um, reap some of the economic benefits of uh, performing this ecosystem service of building soil organic carbon and taking that carbon out of the atmosphere. Uh, irrigation efficiency and other issues related to drought and water management were high on uh, a lot of uh, respondents' minds how to get improved soil water retention uh, through practices such as composting and applying the compost, managing soil salinity, which can be aggravated when it doesn't rain uh, the normal amount, uh, and particularly impacts of drought on pasture health, the grasses themselves and the livestock. <clears throat> and uh, I'm not sure why this picture is missing down here. Um, well, I'm not sure why it was removed, but there was a picture. Which Click on it again, maybe it'll show up. There you go. Ah, yeah, okay. <laughs> Made it a two slide click. Okay, um, extremes of drought and flood have been taking place with increasing intensity as the climates have shifted worldwide. Just some farmer quotes from the uh, National Organic Research Agenda. Um, 
drought and heat waves and the cost of mitigating have cost me an awful lot. It's hard to get, uh, go on, imagine how to do on, go on farming profitably. Uh, another farmer noted that uh, in the year of the survey, there were uh, doubts of drowning rain and then uh, immediately followed by such severe drought uh, that, uh, excuse me, three years earlier, there was excessive rain. And then in the year of the survey, the drought was reaching one in 400 years. Um, and another farmer up in uh, uh, Haber, Montana, uh, farms on an average 11 inches of rain a year. Um, and I'll be talking about their farm more later. It's Doug and Anna Crabtree of uh, Villicus Farms. Uh, here's a picture of some of their highly diversified crop rotations. You can see the strips of different crops through the, through the field. Um, but when uh, he said that there were three years, the last three years of moisture was 26 inches, which is more than double normal, and 2.5, which is impossible for the best farmer to, to grow crops. And then the next year was a, a, still a drought at five and a half. And when the California drought broke, uh, this is what happened in that really wet winter. There were uh, walnut orchards and other uh, farmlands stand in standing water after the excessive rainfall. Uh, and I want you to uh, keep an eye on that uh, picture uh, and see if you uh, recognize it again later in the presentation. Okay. Um, irrigation in the era of climate change. This is getting to be an issue because as the droughts get more intense, there are times when the water authorities say that just is not enough water to put as much water on your vegetable crops as you would like. And this, uh, uh, this was one of the motivating factors in a study uh, funded by ORFRF uh, by a, a scientist at uh, uh, UC Davis, Amelie Godin, working with a farmer, uh, Scott Park of Park Farms Organics. And we'll talk again more about that later. Uh, but one of the things that they were facing is that, that, is that they just did not have access to the water they needed. And another farmer in the survey noted quite astutely that really irrigation is not truly sustainable. If you're in an arid climate, you have to mine uh, fossil groundwater. So there was a lot of interest in the survey and just finding ways to use water more efficiently, get by with less irrigation. Other climate related concerns in the region are the shifting temperatures means that there may not be enough chill hours that are required to break bud on in a timely fashion on fruit and nut crops, it's particularly mentioned by uh, growers of walnuts and pistachios. Um, other concerns uh, were just a need for new crops and cultivars to adapt to the shifting and ex uh, climates and the more uh, unpredictable extremes. The fact that there are new weeds and pests turning up uh, and then some existing diseases are intensifying as a result of the higher temperatures or the more extreme rainfall. So how does agriculture affect climate? Uh, basically two ways. One is by directly emitting greenhouse gases. And these are the big three, carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, and methane. And also by uh, its impacts on the carbon cycle. Uh, soil and plant cover are major uh, uh, pools of carbon, uh, as well as the atmospheric carbon dioxide. So let's have a quick look at these greenhouse gases, where they come from. Um, I will be talking in terms of carbon equivalents. Uh, like when I say that something, uh, some particular event is equivalent to sequestering or losing a thousand pounds of carbon from the soil, that's this figure right here. So um, equivalent in terms of soil organic carbon. Sources of carbon dioxide of the emission, fossil fuel, of course, uh, the energy used to make inputs, uh, lime and urea do emit the carbon dioxide component as they are broken down and do their work in the soil. Um, and this field burning also releases some carbon dioxide. And then here's another losses of our soil organic carbon and biomass carbon. And we'll talk about that more later. Methane, the biggest contributor in the United States is livestock enteric methane. There's also quite a bit of methane from manure storage, particularly liquids manure. Um, and paddy rice cultivation. This is a relatively minor component in the US, but worldwide it jumps up to 10% of direct greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture because some countries really rely on that as a primary food staple. Nitrous oxide, this is a big one. Uh, nitrogen fertilized soils are responsible for roughly half of the direct greenhouse gas emissions in the United States. And then uh, manure either deposited in, in pasture, wherever it's concentrated, and it's only partially anaerobic, it will tend to lose some nitrous oxide. 
And look at how powerful a greenhouse gas this is. If you're looking at it in terms of the gas, uh, 310 fold as, as much as powerful as CO2 in terms of 100 year global warming. Uh, if we look at the elemental, one pound of nitrogen lost as nitrous oxide will um, be equivalent to losing 133 pounds of soil organic carbon as carbon dioxide. Methane, not such an extreme ratio, but still between seven and eight fold more serious than uh, simply losing it as CO2. Okay, here's uh, a quick picture of direct agricultural emissions. Um, now, EPA doesn't even consider this as agricultural emissions. It's, it's uh, categorized under transportation and um, uh, industrial process, but uh, there was one uh, group up at Washington State University, uh, Lynn Carpenter Boggs and, and colleagues, who went to the trouble of adding that in as a direct emission. But it's still, this is what we tend to focus on. Say, well, how can we save energy? How can we save inputs? It's really only one sixth of the pie. And even with that in there, again, the N2O from the soil and the uh, uh, livestock enteric methane are the big ones. This pie chart does not include this, the CO2 emissions from soil erosion, in situ losses of carbon from the soil, just uh, degradation with that actual physical loss, uh, or the breaking of sod, including a forest for agriculture. So soil and the global carbon cycle, this is where it gets really interesting. This is based on uh, um, a carbon cycle uh, information in uh, Ray Weil and Niall Brady's uh, 15th edition of the Nature and Properties of Soil. It's an excellent volume if you want to learn about soil biology, learn anything about soil, and it's extremely well written. It's, it's, um, it's very readable as uh, technical texts go. Um, so vegetation, uh, uh, these are the, the stocks. These are all in billions of tons. Um, interesting thing is that the vegetation and the atmosphere are roughly similar magnitude, even though we've we bump this up some through all the emissions uh, because of the uh, uh, greenhouse gas net increase. Uh, the soil is larger than these two put together. And that, that could, that's just the organic. There's another 940 billion tons. This is worldwide. Uh, the soil's down to a depth of, I think, one meter or two meters, something like that. Really looking at the entire soil profile. There's this much inorganic or carbonate carbon. Um, so one th now here's the thing to pay attention to. That doesn't look like a big difference. You're looking at a small difference between large numbers, but that's two gigatons and of carbon and total human greenhouse gas footprint on the whole world is about 15 gigatons of carbon per year. So this is over 10%. This net loss of soil organic carbon, mostly organic carbon um, is more than 10% of the entire human greenhouse gas footprint. Now the oceans are working hard to help us offset. They're absorbing three gigatons per year. This is not a good thing because it's acidifying the oceans is threatening the ocean ecosystem. So we don't want that figure to go up where, the, where we want the help is here and here. And we'll see how that can happen. First, the bad news, clear forest, tear up native prairie, turn pasture into cropland, 30 to 50% of the organic carbon in these three soil profiles will be gone within half a century. It's not a good thing. And we've lost um, historically from about beginning of the industrial revolution to the 2010, approximately a third of all greenhouse gas emissions were resulted from this process and not from the use of fossil fuels. Good news is sustainable farming can reverse this awful trend and um, uh, practices like cover crops combined with a diversified rotation, a judicious use of compost and other organic amendments, minimizing tillage, you get more soil carbon. And a number of long-term farming trials comparing organic and conventional systems found that the organic systems, which tended to have a more diverse rotation and used organic rather than mineral uh, uh, synthetic sources of nutrients, they tend to accrue about 400 to 600 pounds of carbon per acre per year compared to the conventional system. In one case, in one of those long-term studies, this was true even comparing the organic with the conventional continuous no-till. And that's partly because the, uh, the continuous no-till grew just corn and soybeans. And although the, the soil was not tilled, it was left fallow over winter. 
So this sums it up. Um, I really like this quote from the California's uh, Department of Food and Agriculture Secretary uh, that what that last slide shows is that agricultural and uh, natural lands across rural America are an important part of our climate solution because of that tremendous capacity to store carbon. Uh, and one thing is that uh, land that has been in crops for long periods of time under conventional agriculture or under even under organic systems with excessive tillage um, will have lost up to 50% of their um, so of their native levels of soil organic carbon. The average is a loss of 45%. Um, improved practices, such as I just showed you, can restore that to at least 85% of the native soil organic carbon level. So that's a huge potential to take carbon out of the atmosphere. It's uh, worth at least several years worth of total human emissions, human caused uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Okay, methane is another big source. Anaerobic soil conditions, there are certain soil microbes, actually uh, most of them are in this group called archaea that look like bacteria, but they're not really that closely related. Uh, fascinating uh, discovery in recent decades. But these, this particular group of, of uh, archaea in anaerobic conditions will burn organic carbon and turn it into um, carbon, uh, into methane. So, um, in the, in the uh, livestock gut, conditions are anaerobic and there's a lot of high carbon organic matter coming through in the form of grasses and forage. They put out about 500 pounds of this methane per, per animal per year. Uh, manure lagoons um, are in increasing use and their increased use is the main driving factor in the current year to year increase in US greenhouse gas emissions directly from agriculture. Uh, flooded rice paddies, they'll put out about 100 pounds, 110 pounds per acre per year. That's one estimate from a study in Texas. It could vary. Um, and we'll look at some ways to get that number down quite a bit. Denitrification and soil emissions. Uh, when you have soluble nitrogen and limited oxygen and available organic carbon, and you got active soil microbes, you're going to get nitrous oxide from this soluble nitrogen. And it's when the water, when the soil is about 80% water uh, filled, the, the pore space, that you get a lot of this activity. It's as low as 60%, which is approximately field capacity for most soils. Uh, you will pretty much stop nitrous oxide formation. Uh, oh, there's the picture. Okay. So this is a, a winter fallow uh, vegetable field in central California. Uh, the, Crop rotations are typically a double crop of vegetables through the summer and throughout the Central Valley and uh, some of the um, maritime regions of California, which have that Mediterranean climate. All the rain comes down in the winter, so in the summer they're growing vegetables, they need to drip irrigate. Um, but in the winter, you get excessive rain. And these are the perfect conditions for nitrous oxide. It's not totally anaerobic on those bed tops, but it is pretty saturated. And when your soil is either very wet or is compacted or is fine textured that slows the rate at which oxygen diffuses through and gives you this prerequisite. Another thing to note about denitrification, if your soil nitrate nitrogen is quite low in the range of six parts per million or less, you won't get much nitrous oxide, even if untimely rain does bring your soil into this 80% water filled condition. Now the International Panel of Climate Change has created some models to estimate the likely amount of nitrous oxide uh, that will be produced. Now they're looking mostly at conventional agriculture. So they say, well, about 1% of your applied uh, conventional fertilizer is likely to become nitrous oxide. And then there's the indirect, that's whatever nitrogen leaches out of the system, uh, you will lose another three quarters of a percent of that leached. So if you put 200 pounds per acre of nitrogen on your corn and half of it leaches, you'll lose two pounds from the field as nitrous oxide and another three quarters of a pound uh, from wherever it leaches to. In organic systems, um, there was a, a meta-analysis of organic uh, nitrogen sources. They averaged somewhat lower. Their emissions factor was on the average 0.57% but it varied from very low from thing, for things like finished compost to actually worse 
than conventional fertilizer when you have liquid manure. Manure slurry is a nitrous oxide uh, risk. Risk factors in organic are lots of active organic matter. If you put down poultry litter, which is very rich in nitrogen, it'll behave a little bit like manure slurry and you get excessive rainfall right afterwards. Or if you just plow in like a very succulent all legume cover crop, and then, you know, this, he's plowing it in now and if that soil is at 50% um, water-filled pore space, it's great. It's not gonna turn into nitrous oxide. It does gradually mineralize. But if it then rains all night and gets it up to 80%, you get a big burst. Um, very challenging thing is we're growing heavy nitrogen feeders like broccoli. We'll get to that a little bit more in some of the research. So organic farming practices can help meet a number of these challenges uh, in two basic ways. Well, three actually, building resilience and that's what I mean is uh, the resilience is the crop's ability to withstand the uh, slings and arrows of uh, climate change and the severe impacts that can occur. Um, sequestering carbon, uh, that's that soil carbon uh, recapture that we we're talking about, and then mitigating greenhouse gases, ways to reduce nitrous oxide and methane particularly. So if anybody wants to type in the answer to this, there is a really sophisticated biotechnology out there. It shows tremendous promise to help us with this climate crisis, both to slow the change and to protect our food system, make it more resilient. It's not actually a human invention. I'll give you about 10 seconds to think about that. Get a little climate change here. It's rather hot here in Virginia. Okay, living plants. They're what made soil in the first place. And they build healthy, resilient soils in a number of ways. When you got living plant cover, the rain doesn't bash the soil, the sun doesn't bake it into a crust, it doesn't wash away. The living roots are constantly feeding the soil life and building this crumb structure that further improves the soil's water and air uh, holding capacity and the ability for roots to go deep. And then as those plants grow their roots down, they deepen the soil profile. Uh, so you have, this is the basis of healthy soil. And then living plants are the original carbon sequestration. It's how the oil and coal and the gas got on the ground in the first place. And it's how we're gonna start getting it back down there to balance what we have used. And so the roots deliver that organic carbon to the soil up to 50% in the case of perennials and uh, 20, 30% at least for annuals. And uh, we'll talk about this more later, but the deep roots will build uh, the soil carbon below tillage depth, which is really important because you don't, it can't be uh, lost every time you go through to cultivate for weeds. So this is a very interesting fact. Um, many studies of soil health, effects of no-till, effects of cover crops, uh, climate mitigation potential, focus on the top foot or even the top four to eight inches. This is where all the activity is. If, you, if I had a, another graph here of soil biolog biological activity and microbial biomass or respiration, it would look something like this. It'd be really high and then it would drop way low and just be a little bit, but a little bit all the way down. But roots like to send their roots, uh, plants like to send their roots deep Annual crops typically three to six feet, perennials five or 10 or 20 feet. And half of the world's soil organic carbon is deeper than 12 inches. Now that is a conservative estimate, um, taking into consideration the top meter, which goes to about three and a half feet. So uh, that is why this deeper part of the profile is important when it comes to climate mitigation and carbon sequestration, because there isn't as much microbial activity and because the oxygen levels are lower, that organic matter turns over more slowly. So these roots may deposit only a fifth as much as these near the surface, but it may last 10 times as long. So just a general uh, review of how soil health will improve resilience. Just the fact that you've got good soil structure, it's a deep open profile, it's gonna store lots of moisture and it's gonna do it without getting waterlogged because any excess if it rains five inches and you really only need three, the other two are gonna drain out. Um, but then if you have it, if the rain stops, sun comes out and it gets drier and drier and drier, you've got this tremendous reserve and you got the plants able to tap it. In addition, all the biological activity is increasing resilience to a number of stresses, including drought itself, as well as plant diseases. Those are the two main ones, but also uh, nutrient availability fluctuations when you have all of those beneficial symbionts helping the roots get nutrients 
you have a healthier crop and a couple of bad days of climate, you know, extreme climate conditions is not going to hurt them too badly. So um, it's looking at the practices that organic and other sustainable farmers like to use to maintain soil health. You'll see that a lot, they, they all contribute to both direct mitigation and to resilience or adaptation. Um, this, kip, this is a, a set of practices that, I, uh, that has been summed up under something called sustainable crop intensification. The idea is to grow as much biomass as possible and do it sustainably. You're not doing it by loading on the uh, synthetic nitrogen uh, because that'll actually burn up uh, soil organic carbon and increase nit nitrous oxide. But if you're using good organic practices, you're using cover crops, using a sod phase, you're avoiding bare fallow periods, maintaining that living root mass. You're, it's a major source of soil organic carbon and it will help tend to mitigate this uh, nitrous oxide. And of course, healthy soils grows healthy crops and the drought tolerance increases. Diversifying the crop, simply diversifying even at the same level of intensity, your soil organic carbon will again uh, tend to go up. It's not as dramatic, but uh, the diversification alone is important. It also um, builds soil biodiversity so that your soil life covers more of the functions that are needed. Uh, and then by diversifying your crops, instead of just growing corn and soybeans, you're growing corn, soy, wheat, sunflower, and a vegetable, let's say, your risks of a, of a severe financial loss for one of those crops failing goes down. Nutrient management, this is critical for managing nitrous oxide. Um, and then when you, when you uh, are conservative with nutrients, you avoid overloading the soil with, with nitrogen and other nutrients. Your rhizosphere health improves, nutrient cycling improves. Um, excessive levels of nutrients tend to uh, reduce the activity of that beneficial bi microbiome. Management intensive rotational grazing and crop livestock integration into your system. Uh, excellent for building soil organic carbon and by not having those manure lagoons and by maintaining high quality forage, you do reduce uh, the uh, methane emissions related to uh, livestock production. And again, uh, these pastures that are managed this way are known for their drought resilience and the uh, luxuriant forage while next door a continuously grazed or neglected pasture will, will look kind of like, um, like death after a period of drought. Uh, compost, we'll talk about this a bit more, uh, more later. It does help uh, hold soil organic carbon in the soil. And um, I'm putting methane here mainly because if you're composting materials that would otherwise have ended up in a manure lagoon or a landfill, you are shifting from a situation where most of that organic carbon will turn to methane into a situation where half of it becomes carbon dioxide, eightfold less harmful, and half of it becomes soil organic carbon. And of course, we know the benefits of compost to soil and crop health. Okay, and really good to combine practices. One thing to remember about no-till, just not tilling at all is very beneficial, but it basically allows um, organic carbon to become physically protected in aggregates near the surface. And that's, there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, that improves aggregation. You know, leaving this untilled, that soil is much more able to absorb moisture than if it had been tilled and left fallow. However, that carbon is not that stable. Eventually, most farmers are gonna have to take um, a tiller or, or some kind of a cultivator to deal with perennial weeds, especially organic farmers are not using any herbicides. You will need some tillage. So, and that surface carbon is not at all stable. It easily is lost with that one pass. Cover crops by themselves, especially if you do till them in, don't tend to build a lot of carbon. If you take a succulent cover crop like this, if I went through and mowed that and then tilled it in, we create this tremendous burst of biological activity and it would be great for my next crop. I'd be releasing nutrients and building up beneficial microbes, but I won't be building up much carbon. There will be some carbon from the deeper root mass that wasn't touched by the tiller. Um, so you wanna combine cover cropping and uh, no-till through roll crimping and planting in one pass. This is a uh, this enhances both the amount and the stability of carbon that's accrued. Other practices, uh, diversifying the rotation. I mentioned this. I don't need to dwell a lot on it. Um, but if you go from a corn soy rotation to something that looks like this, or from a very simple vegetable rotation to something where you got more species and you got some high biomass cover crops, uh, you'll definitely improve your carbon. 
Uh, making it using compost wisely, there are a couple of caveats with com compost. You do have the stable organic carbon, beneficial microbes. If you're making compost from on-farm sources, it's great because you're, you're improving nutrient cycling. And as I mentioned this, you're diverting uh, waste. Um, anything, um, there's no such thing as organic waste. We waste organic residues. So um, anything that would otherwise have gone to waste that gets here, uh, you've already uh, taken a big step forward in terms of climate mitigation. There are some concerns. The composting process itself will emit some uh, nitrous oxide. And if, you, and if you don't manage the um, aeration, you will get a little bit of methane as well. If you take feedstock from other acreage, like you're, you're, you're harvesting hay from your neighbor's farm and throwing it in your compost pile, or you're taking materials from native ecosystems, uh, that's really gonna be a zero sum game at best and will harm the, the donor acreage. If you use a lot of compost, you will accrue excessive soil phosphorus. The biggest drawback from the climate viewpoint is that mycorrhizal fungi help stabilize soil organic carbon and they help mitigate nitrous oxide. So you want them on the team when we're trying to mitigate climate impacts. They're also excellent for, um, for resilience because of their uh, many uh, beneficial effects uh, on soil and plant health. Um, nitrous oxide is a real beast and I call it the beast because it's so unpredictable, especially in organic systems when uh, when you manage for high soil biological activity and high soil organic matter, you are giving, you are actually um, creating two of the requisites for uh, a heavy release of nitrous oxide. And if you happen to turn down a high uh, nitrogen rich cover crop or apply some chicken manure and then you get a big rain the next day, then you have all four ingredients and you can have a burst of nitrous oxide that even exceeds what, is a, uh, what a conventional system might lose. On the whole, that doesn't always happen, but it can. Um, so here's a few things to look at. Uh, the more you can get nitrogen from slow release sources in the soil organic matter itself, the better. Um, ban concentration, concentrated nitrogen in rows at low rates. Um, avoid um, putting a lot of nitrogen in when you're gonna get wet conditions, et cetera. Sowing legumes with grasses in the cover crop, both a grass cover crop, both the annual and an, a perennial cover crop is a good idea. You get that balance and it's better for soil health anyway. Pearl millet is an example of a cover crop. It's got very deep roots and it can cleanse all the excess nitrate down to six feet. And that'll reduce those indirect nitrous oxide emissions. Okay, this is how to grow rice without creating a lot of methane. Um, the method is you don't flood the fields, you do keep them pretty wet. So you do get some nitrous oxide, but they're not flooded. The seedlings are set singly one foot apart rather than in these clumps that are really crowded. They use compost for fertility. It's basically an organic method. Um, the results are much healthier soil because it's not flooded. You got healthy plant roots. In flooded rice, even though the rice is surviving and the weeds are killed by the flooding, the condition of the rice roots is really quite poor by the time it's setting uh, seed. So uh, another important uh, practice is using livestock to restore soil. Uh, this is known as a man emission intensive grazing. I don't wanna go into a lot of details because we're short of time, uh, but suffice it to say that when these systems are managed right, they can sequester one or more tons per acre per year of uh, soil organic carbon. And when you throw in uh, silvo pasture, you have trees and grazing integrated, uh, you increase that even further. And when you use multi-species integrate uh, grazing, you tend to improve overall resilience, again, because of that diversity factor. The difference between just continuous grazing and management intensive rotational grazing, you see all these paddocks here. One of the things that happens in continuous grazing is you get the cows tending to drop all the manure in one spot that they like to be in. That can be a nitrous oxide hot spot. Uh, you also have healthier cattle when they're ro rotated through, and of course the pasture is a lot healthier too. And this improved pasture quality can reduce the per cow enteric methane by about 30%. Perennial crops and conservation buffers. I think the entire world should have a policy of any land that is disused, degraded, or um, is bare, is not growing living plants, native uh, vegetation or whatever. If you get into perennial plantings of whatever is useful, you know, this is beneficial habitat at uh, Villicus Farms and then you have uh, agroforestry over here. Um, between the, the soil 
carbon and the above ground uh, biomass carbon, you're again sequestering large amounts of carbon. Um, I'm going to go very quickly through this because then I'm going to get into the really interesting part of uh, research that's been done in the California and uh, neighboring states. Um, so um, farmers wanted to be able to get some remuneration for this very important service of helping to mitigate the climate. So first thing you have to do is estimate what the actual benefits are of changes in practices, and that's very challenging. We have federal conservation programs that don't directly pay plant, uh, farmers for climate uh, mitigation, but a lot of the NRCS practices are addressed to soil health, soil organic matter, and therefore at least um, resilience as well as some carbon sequestration. And there's some very interesting state and local programs as well. Okay. Um, estimating uh, the footprint, and I just want to just very briefly point out Comet Farm is a model that is used for estimating uh, whole farm greenhouse gas and um, uh, cover crops, organic amendments and such. They are updating the tool. The uh, researchers at Colorado State are updating the tool for organic practices to include those. And then there is an organic farming footprint uh, model being developed at Washington State. Uh, NRCS conservation programs, the Working Lands Programs, Conservation Stewardship Program, and Environmental Quality Incentives Program, they support these practices of cover cropping, improved rotation, advanced grazing, conservation buffers, and then the comprehensive planning. Um, NRCS has had a soil health initiative for about eight or 10 years and developed these four principles, which have been the basis for a lot of what we've been talking about. Um, see the notes for a lot more on, on uh, the details of each of these. Uh, I won't have time to go into it now. The 2018 Farm Bill had a strong emphasis on soil health, and it never did mention climate change per se, but if you go through, you'll see there's two places in the title to the conservation title that talks about helping farmers cope with increasing weather volatility. In other words, climate resilience, climate adaptation. This is the California Healthy Soils Program, uh, which has been going for a number of years and recently received more funding. Some of the funding comes from a cap and trade, carbon cap and trade program within the state. And some of it comes from other funding sources. Um, there is incentives for these kinds of practices, cover crops, compost, reduced tillage, mulching. Um, and there's some demo projects as well. And uh, part of the program is to uh, improve ability to measure and estimate greenhouse gas benefits of these programs. Other state programs, New Mexico has introduced a healthy soils program uh, for research monitoring and technical assistance. Hawaii is, uh, now has a carbon farming task force and they're, uh, they're just in the early stage of development, but they're gonna supposed to report back uh, in a couple of years with recommendations for best practices in Hawaii and um, a certificate for carbon farming and carbon credits. The Soil Health Institute lists additional state agency and university programs around the country. A couple of interesting examples. State of Maryland has cost shared cover cropping for uh, about six or eight years, mostly to protect the Chesapeake Bay water quality, but never mind. But the result is that half of their cropland is now cover cropped and state, you know, nationwide, it's only around 10 or 15%. So that's an excellent outcome, uh, sequestering a lot of carbon there. Um, and uh, the other one is uh, Iowa. It not only has been cost sharing cover crops per se at $15 an acre, but also offers a $5 per acre discount on crop insurance if you plant a cover crop. So countering the inadvertent trend of penalizing cover cropping and complex rotations in insurance programs, Iowa is now saying that if you use cover crops, you get a $5 discount. Pretty cool. Just some of my examples that I think the Western region can certainly learn from. All right, here's what I was wanting to get to 20 minutes ago before um, my system crashed here. And I apologize for that, for having an ancient uh, modem that did that to you all. Um, okay, saving water through uh, soil health and deficit irrigation. This is a project conducted with OFRF funding by uh, organic grower uh, Scott Park and UC Davis researcher uh, Amelie uh, Godin and uh, colleagues. The question is, can healthy soil improve water use efficiency? And 
Um, the first year of the study was at the, at the park farm, and he has a number of, made, of and it's not just organic farming that you know, meets the letter of the uh, NOP standards. He has a diverse crop rotation, winter cover crops, and you will see in the next half dozen slides that winter cover crops are absolutely essential for um, in uh, Mediterranean climates, especially when you're producing most of your crops during the summer uh, with irrigation during the summer dry season. Um, he uses compost and a microbial inoculant. He also uses gypsum, uh, which I don't know as much about. I don't know what its role in this whole larger soil health picture is. However, he does reduce tillage and he uses controlled traffic, uh, very minimal tillage for an organic system. First year of experiments, he tried cutting off the irrigation two weeks early. Standard process, uh, procedure was a tomato crop versus like processing tomatoes. You irrigate till about a month before harvest and you let things dry down. So he tried cutting off at 45 days. He saved a half an acre foot of water that year. That's a lot of water. Yield and quality were unchanged. End of season soil microbial activity was actually doubled by having not as much water put on that ground and there was less nitrate nitrogen available for leaching at the end of the season. So 2017, they uh, did the study at again at Park Organics and at a nearby conventional farm. And although cutting off irrigation um, two weeks early only saved a little bit, they just weren't irrigating as much in general that year. What the big difference was that on the organic farm, the soil moisture content was about double that of a nearby conventional farm on a fairly similar soil. These are like a mile apart, so they got the same, same weather basically. Um, and it, because of that doubled uh, soil um, water holding capacity, he used less than half the moisture. So compared conventional versus organic, saved a full acre foot, whether they were cut off at 45 days or at 30 days. And as a result, your water use efficiency, um, how many tons of tomatoes per acre foot of water went way up in the organic system. Yields were similar and there was a slight upward trend in the quality in the organic system and with reduced irrigation. So this is what happens when you cover crop during the winter ra rainy season. Remember that? <laughs> Beginning of the, of, the, of the presentation. And these are pictures by uh, Dr. Uh, Zahinger Kabir, uh, who's with NRCS in uh, Central California. And he's been studying soil health and water relations and climate and all kinds of uh, related issues. Same day after the same storm, another walnut orchard. No ponded water. It's muddy, but it's not ponded. It's not anaerobic. And it's because there's a cover crop. And even though it looks like a small, thin cover crop, just having something living in those alleys um, made all the difference in soil health and in the ability of that one heavy rain to get in. Okay. All right, we seem to be, um, okay. So this is an interesting, this is another photograph by the uh, same um, investigator. He was driving down a road. He saw this nice green field to the left and this lake to the right. He said, hmm. So uh, what happens? You look closer, this field is full of wheat, it's full of uh, grain. And uh, over here, this is completely covered in water. So this is gonna, while it's completely anaerobic like that, it's gonna be giving off methane, turning a lot of the organic matter into methane. And then when it starts to dry down, but it's still pretty wet, it's gonna get a bunch of nitrous oxide. Whereas over here, this wheat cover crop is soaking up that nitrate nitrogen um, and it's turning into plant biomass and is turning atmospheric CO2 into more biomass. So here's a big challenge. Or, uh, broccoli is an incredibly heavy feeder. Even in organic rate, uh, nitrogen rate trials, this is with uh, feather meal as, as nit uh, organic nitrogen or other organic allowable materials in the case of California, a mixture of feather meat and blood meals. These are all relatively high concentrated, uh, quickly released nitrogen sources. Even though these organic fertilizers are relatively expensive, the broccoli response all the way up past 200 pounds per acre was such that farmers were realizing four to $30, $4 return per dollar of nitrogen. 
is it sustainable? In Washington, they saw um, considerable nitrate, nitrogen in the soil, around 20 or 30 parts a million at the end of the season, certainly enough to have some leaching and maybe some denitrification. In California, uh, some uh, modeling studies based on several years of field research estimated the yield optimum economically at 215 pounds of nitrogen per acre from these organic sources. 180 pounds leached, another 23 pounds emitted as nitrous oxide. Uh, that means that there was some soil organic matter releasing nitrogen, which was harvested off, but you have these tremendous losses. And because of the high levels of nitrogen, you had a net loss of organic matter. Now, a big a one step forward was to say, okay, what if we give some, get some of that nitrogen in the form of compost and cover crops, two thirds of it from those sources, improve the organic matter, cut the nitrous oxide by half, but there was still the same amount of leaching. Now, one thing to remember, uh, this amount of nitrous oxide, nitrogen loss, um, negates 3,000 pounds per acre of carbon sequestration. In other words, that went as far in the hole, climate-wise, as a good rotational grazed pasture uh, moves you forward in terms of mitigation. So cutting that in half is better than nothing, but it's still nowhere near sustainable. Doesn't look too good for broccoli. It doesn't look too good for organic production in a Mediterranean climate, but here's the kicker. There's another study where the rotation, this is down in Salinas Valley, uh, 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 Daniel Brennan, I think, oh, Eric Brennan is the name right there, thank you. Um, had a rotation of spring lettuce, fall broccoli, and then either a winter cover crop or winter fallow um, and given compost as a major nutrient and organic matter source. Fascinating result. Whenever there was a fallow year, uh, and now I just want to back up a moment. The fall broccoli, which is planted like in midsummer and harvested in October, November, received 145 pounds of nitrogen per acre. Not a tremendous amount considering the, the 200 optimal we saw earlier, but still a fair amount. So, uh, and the spring lettuce just receives from compost. So what happens is when you plant a cover crop, the spring lettuce yields well. You get 3,000, uh, no, you, you get 1,000 30 pound boxes. That's 30,000 pounds per acre, a nice lettuce yield. And you grow your broccoli. Whenever this was fallow, the yields of the lettuce were either less than half or a complete crop loss. So what's going on here? Well, doesn't matter whether you had legumes in the mix or not. You could plant winter rye and get the same good result. It's all about nitrogen recycling. The broccoli took only a quarter of that 145 pounds per acre with harvest. The rest sat in the field. You got something growing all winter. It recycles the nitrogen. You turn it under. It gives it back to your lettuce. Meanwhile, you got a lot less uh, leaching and, nit and denitrification. So that, that just really brought it home how vital winter cover crops are in this, or in, in, uh, this uh, part of the world. Now, this is with a summer crop. This isn't so much on cover crops, but uh, tomatoes, organic tomatoes, again, in Central California, uh, uh, Jackson and Bowles and uh, colleagues did a study of 13 fields, and there were three patterns. Two of the fields were just deficient. The nitrogen, nitrate nitrogen hovered at six parts per million or less. The yields were low. Organic matter was kind of low, and the manure they put on apparently didn't release nitrogen in good synchrony with crop needs, so that wasn't too good. And then there were seven fields that were nitrogen saturated. They really slathered on the nitrogen, high concentrated sources like feather meal and guano, uh, things with a low carbon to nitrogen ratio. Uh, organic carbon, soil organic carbon was better. These were better fields to begin with. The nitrate nitrogen was high, often like 16, 20 parts per million, which isn't tremendously high, but it's what most conventional recommendations think that a crop would need. This, it seemed okay, but there was definitely a risk of some nitrous oxide emissions because of that higher level. There were four fields that had tight nitrogen cycling, very high organic matter, very high biological activity, uh, organisms that uh, released enzymes uh, that worked with tomato roots to enhance nutrient cycling. You had high yields with no, almost no risk of nitrous oxide because the nitrate nitrogen never got a higher than six parts per million the entire season. Fascinating result, and uh, I think an area of which there is much greater research. They were very optimistic that this could be done not just with tomatoes in California, but with many crops in many parts of the, of the country, 
because the plant enzymes that were involved in that plant micro partnership for um, nutrient cycling are widely, um, they occur widely in the plant kingdom throughout crops. It's not just a tomato phenomenon. Here's another study uh, in the maritime part of Washington, uh, Puyallup. Um, they did uh, 11 years of vegetable, organic vegetable rotations, and they either gave them compost or poultry litter to provide a certain amount of nitrogen. It's about the same total nitrogen every year. This is typically six or eight tons per acre annually. This is typically around two tons. So after 11 years, the higher this compost improved soil structure, water infiltration, has 35% more microbial activity, 43% more total soil organic carbon. Um, and there were shifts in the soil biota that indicated that this system is less likely to emit a lot of nitrous oxide. Uh, in Utah, and this, is, this answers the concern about depending very heavily on compost and imported organic matter and building up excessive phosphorus, et cetera. But in Utah, um, they applied compost really heavily, but they did it just once. This is like 22 tons dry weight, and it was a moderate C to N compost based on manure and bedding. Uh, again, a nice balanced material. One application at that high rate doubled topsoil organic carbon and organic wheat yields for 15 years. So that was pretty impressive. And another one in, a, in some rangeland in California was kind of depleted. They did one out compost application. Again, the same kind of thing, a mixture of yard waste and bedding and manure to make the compost. Um, enhanced plant production so much that net carbon storage in the soil profile increased several fold more than you would expect from that compost itself. Life cycle analyses uh, when you're diverting materials from uh, landfills into the composting stream, uh, you get tremendous benefits in terms of climate mitigation, uh, greenhouse gas mitigation. And many studies across the country have shown that a little bit of compost in conjunction with those um, uh, crop intensification and diversification, the, the tight rotations of high biomass cover crops, that little bit of compost works in a complementary and synergistic way to imp further improve the uh, carbon sequestration and overall resilience. <clears throat> Orchards and vineyards, bare, bare soil management, whether it's by tillage or by no-till with herbicides, which is a conventional system, of course, they'll lose half their soil organic carbon over, the, over time extremely rough on soil on soil health and you think oh my god uh, I'm in Utah and I need to irrigate I need to be really really um, careful not to use more water turns out that growing keeping the alleys covered in a, in a perennial cover and even growing shallow rooted uh, living mulches right under the trees does not increase water consumption and meanwhile your soil health improves tree health improves probably you're improving the water holding capacity of that soil as much as you're increasing water consumption by having the entire orchard floor covered. Similar results in Oregon. Um, if you have living mulch, you get improved soil organic matter and nitrogen cycling and microbial activity. Uh, you get immediately favorable results with a, either an organic mulch or a, uh, a landscape fabric, which is a porous, um, it'll emit rainfall, but it'll block weeds. Uh, bear fowl is the worst. Again, it tears up soil, soil quality. Uh, Bonterra Vineyards did some studies of their organic and biodynamic and uh, conventional farms. And it wasn't as large an increase, but it's pretty consistent. You had higher levels of organic carbon, once again, with the organic system. Okay, here's this nice deep-rooted crop again. But if you're in dry land, you're trying to grow crops on 11 inches of rain a year, and you're not irrigating, you do need to be a little careful of some of these deep-rooted crops. Some of them are very heavy water users. They are drought resilient because they send their roots down 30 feet and they, they soak up all the water. Uh, example is alfalfa. Uh, and some of the invasive exotic weeds of uh, dry rangeland are invasive partly because of this trait and partly also because of their effects on soil microbiota. But this is a, a serious one in these dry regions, something I learned uh, second hand, but through some very good research and uh, farmer experience. Uh, the challenge is you can say, well, it's too dry to grow cover crops. Let's just skip it. Let's just stick with this wheat fallow. That depletes soil organic carbon, even if you're doing no-till. Even if you're doing our organic no-till, it's going to deplete the carbon. You've got to grow something in that off year. 
These are some crops that are fairly deep rooted, very drought resilient, but they are drought resilient because they can get by with very little moisture. So they don't hog the moisture. Pearl millet is excellent. Sunflower is a valuable oil seed and it is in the Villicus farm rotation, but it is also a heavy user, user of moisture. So that's something to keep in mind. It's more like alfalfa than like the, the millet. Barley, uh, the medics, which are related to alfalfa and a legume, um, and cowpea, which is another legume, they tend to conserve moisture as well. They use relatively little. And yes, you can build soil organic carbon on limited rainfall. Again, Villicus Farms, uh, Doug and Anna Crabtree, they have a diverse rotation. Never leave the soil bare. This is an interesting one. They're actually growing two cash crops together, flax and camet, and they separate very easily during cle seed cleanings. You get two crops coming out of the bin. Uh, no fallow. Um, after about uh, nine years in this rotation, or 10 years, their average increase in soil organic matter was about 27%. Now that's like whatever their value was to begin with, it's gone up by another quarter. I'm not saying it went up by 27 uh, pounds per 100 pounds of soil, but it did go up significantly. And a little more moisture, and I'm stepping out of the Western region, but only next door in North Dakota, um, excellent book written by uh, Gabe Brown as a rancher is managing 5,000 acres. It's called Dirt to Soil. And that one, um, he just talked about his experience, 20 years of uh, management intensive rotational grazing integrated with crops that were managed basically by the four NRCS principles of soil health, a diversification, um, maximizing living root, maximizing cover, et cetera, and minimizing disturbance. He is not a fully organic grower and he is fully no-till, uh, but the system has allowed, allowed him to reduce um, chemical inputs to probably more than 90% less than a typical farm. In the meantime, the organic matter went from 2%, which is severely depleted, up to 7%, which is close to the native level of eight to 9%. Uh, and that represents on that 5,000 acre ranch in 20 years, he has single handedly sequestered 125,000 tons of carbon. If it weren't for him, we might even have more tornadoes by now. I tell you what, it's very impressive. Anyway, a few unanswered research questions. Um, soil inorganic carbon. This is carbonates that occur in many semi-arid region soils. It's often deposited in a subsoil horizon like this very nice uh, picture by Ray Weil. Uh, you can see the calcium carbonate there. Um, one of the things that you say, okay, I want to farm this organically and I want to go crops that like a pH of seven, but the pH is eight and a half. What if I put on a little bit of sulfur or I put on highly acidic organic amendments to get that pH down to seven, seven and a half? You could be turning some of that carbonate into carbon dioxide. Um, so even just adding organic residues or changing the type of crop of this growing, the type, type of vegetation can change the dynamic what's going on down here. Uh, there was a review of seven organic versus conventional comparisons um, in a, a paper that I read by uh, Lorenz and Lau. Three out of seven um, cases, there were substantial losses of this inorganic carbon, nine to 14 tons. That's a lot when you consider uh, uh, that one of the best examples that I showed was uh, gaining 25 tons per acre in 20 years. Uh, if you're losing this much in uh, about 10 years, that's a, that's a worry. So a lot of research is needed on soil inorganic carbon conservation on this type of soil. And even on a prairie soil, such as in North Dakota, uh, with 15 inches of rain, you can have quite a bit of inorganic carbon. <clears throat> Another question is uh, soil organic carbon uh, saturation. You can't expect even the best system to go on sequestering carbon forever. Because what happens is you improve how the soil is managed and your soil organic carbon is going to rebound that it's going to hit a new steady state. Now, the resilience factor, the adaptation, uh, this is going to continue to give you all those soil health benefits and resilience, but you're not going to get more and more carbon sequestration. We can't expect the farmers to fix the whole climate crisis. Um, however, things to consider is right now cropland, as I mentioned, is at this 55% level. Best of what we know today is likely to get it up to 85%, and maybe some future uh, innovations may get us up close to 100%. It's still worth doing, both because of the uh, 
uh, resilience that is gained and also because uh, even just doing this 55 to 85 percent and getting our uh, letting our soils do this kind of curve will give us several more years to get our act together as a world to bring the climate crisis under control and balance our emissions with uh, annual sequestration. One thing to note, this is the no-till curve uh, in a review. This is actually a meta-analysis of a number of studies, but every, t as I mentioned before, if you till it once because you got a bad weed problem, this will drop sharply. The same study looked at crop diversification and that created only a very gradual increase, but this goes on for 40 years until eventually it gets up to this general level. Uh, and again, it's more stable. You're not gonna lose that by cultivating once for weeds. Climate change itself could get us in a vicious cycle because as the weather gets warmer, it's gonna tend to accelerate oxidation of soil organic carbon, especially pronounced in colder climates. Uh, on the other hand, tropical regions only see a slight worsening of this as the temperatures rise a little bit. And those tropical regions, uh, the soil organic carbon dynamics are quite responsive to organic and sustainable practices. So that's a uh, thing that's on the, on the positive side. So that means as our climate's warm, organic practices may make a real difference. Uh, following a permafrost and oxidation of peat soil, this is a really serious source of loss of carbon. Nitrous oxide emissions increase about 20% for each degree uh, Celsius or 1.8 Fahrenheit increase in mean temperatures. And the increase in atmospheric carbon dioxide itself may also change how the soil biota behave uh, in a way that could uh, increase losses. So just quickly summing up, some research needs and opportunities. Um, crop breeding for climate resilience uh, I think there's a lot of opportunity there. Simply breeding and selecting crops in organic and sustainable systems will make them more responsive to the kind of healthy soils that we build for resilience. And that will also improve the farm's ability to withstand, uh, as I say, the extremes of weather that we're facing. Nutrient deficiency is vital. Uh, the better we can get crops to work with the soil microbes to be, uh, obtain nutrients, the less nitrogen we have to put on, the less nitrous oxide we'll be making, and the less carbon dioxide at the fertilizer plant uh, for non-organic systems, that is. And in organic systems, if we're not as dependent on those highly concentrated materials or we use them very judiciously, you know, as a little bit of in-row um, uh, band application to give a crop a little boost without saturating the soil, those kinds of things. But we need crops that will respond to those systems and in general, climate-friendly organic systems, like crops that'll thrive in an organic minimum till system. Deep roots for soil carbon sequestration, this has actually been recommended as a research priority for climate mitigation because of that potential to store up carbon very deep in the soil profile, which may well be how the coal got there in the first place, although it's also possible there were other mechanisms. Uh, tightly coupled nitrogen cycling, as I say, there's a lot of potential here, not just for tomatoes in California, but uh, crops in general. And we need more research that will support government and or other programs that will uh, actually remunerate farms for the ecosystem service of storing up carbon and mitigating climate uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Okay. Um, questions. Uh, this was uh, all made possible by Western SARE. I can't remember if there's another uh, set of uh, acknowledgements here or not, but uh, this is it. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Um, we did have a couple questions coming in the queue. Um, the indirect NO2 emission of the leached nitrogen. Do you have any idea where that research comes from? I think it might be um, if it's from the IPCC. Um, they're they have um, like scaling factors or mul multipliers that you can um, basically multiply how much nitrogen, mineral nitrogen or, or, comp or what you expect to mineralize from um, organic sources by like 0.75 or actually this would be 0 0.0075. Um, and so it would be from IPCC. Okay, Megan, there's someone else who has a question. Um, and um, they're wondering about carbon sequestration. And besides util utilizing plants and living roots to build, build up SOC, are there any proven technologies to your knowledge in terms of soil amendments that have really pro um, proven MOA for carbon sequestration? 
Um, what is, I'm not sure what the MOA is standing okay. for here, but, so, uh, but proven for carbon sequestration. Well, so in California, um, we, for the state of California, we have like synthesized a bunch of uh, research that's looked at this um, for agricultural systems in this climate and um, applying compost, doing reduced tillage, cover cropping, um, and we're more, we're looking at now doing um, a bunch of experiments using biochar um, across the state and also rock amendment. Um, all of these things can help, um, have been shown to sequester more carbon into the soil and also enhance um, nutrient availability and water holding capacity, um, but they haven't been studied um, in combination. And so we want to look at the at the effect of these things um, in different um, soil types across California. Um, so I, I, I think that answers a little bit more about um, how to build up soil carbon, not just from growing the plants, but adding amendments. And um, someone else wants to know about, what about agroforestry for carbon sequestration? Well, Growing trees is definitely a good way to sequester carbon. Um, it expanding any forest area, but also using it for um, food or fiber would be um, definitely a way to mitigate climate change. And also it's a long-term um, strategy for like building the carbon up in roots and storage um, in the soil. Um, one person before had a question about um, breaking sod, as you mentioned, um, going from a weedy field to a crop ready area. What do you think is the best approach for doing that? Oh, really good question. In terms of climate, breaking sod. Um, if your sod is a mixture of grasses and legumes, uh, one thing I would do is say, try to try to go fairly shallow. Don't go in with a deep moldboard plow and invert the profile deeply. Go just deep enough to knock out the crowns and to let the deeper roots decay in situ. Now, if you have a lot of invasive deep-rooted weeds like Canada thistle, that's not going to work because they can send up new plants from roots down, you know, way in the subsoil. But if you have uh, let's say you have uh, a lot of pasture grasses and uh, some clovers in there, but it's not tremendously heavy in the legumes. You could probably break that sod, work it in, uh, and not have a lot of nitrous losses. You will have some uh, soil car carbon losses anytime you disturb the soil. One thing I would look at, especially in, in drier regions, is the blade plow or sweet plow undercutter. Um, it's designed to skim just below the soil surface, knock out the crowns of both weeds and cover crops or sod, uh, but to leave the residue on the surface so you're disturbing only a relatively shallow slice of the soil profile. <clears throat> okay, um, another question that came in earlier is, um, can you talk more about the relationship between mycorrhizal fungi and phosphorus as mentioned in your compost slide at the early on in the presentation. Oh yeah, um, mycorrhizal fungi, one of, one of the reasons, one of the advantages to plants associating with uh, mycorrhizal fungi is improved the capacity to take up phosphorus. And most of these uh, symbiotic um, mutualistic relationships are an outcome of a very complex two-way signaling between the microbe and the plants, true of both rhizobia and mycorrhizal fungi and other uh, root zone symbionts. So if the plant is saturated in plenty of phosphorus, it will not be sending out signals to the mycorrhizae to wake them up. So the mycorrhizae will tend to go dormant. They won't be as active. Um, and that can, uh, even though plants getting plenty of phosphorus, it can leave the crop a little bit less resilient, maybe a lot less resilient to drought because what the mycorrhizae, uh, active mycorrhizae do is to double and triple the effective volume of the root system. So when you have high phosphorus levels uh, through at least that mechanism and maybe other mechanisms, it tends to throw the mycorrhizal component into dormancy. 
And the other thing that mycorrhizae do is they release a, pro, a, a sugar protein compound called glomalin that helps to stabilize soil organic matter. It itself is sticky and very slow to break down, and it does make a significant contribution to stabilizing uh, soil organic carbon. So uh, you want to keep your phosphorus levels in the low to moderate range, and it's not, it's not an all or nothing thing. It isn't like you get to 100 parts per million and all your mycorrhizae disappear. But there is a, a negative correlation between uh, soil phosphorus levels and mycorrhizal activity. Okay, um, we have another question in the chat box here. It says it's clear that healthy soils and higher SOC levels can retain soil moisture. Have there been studies to evaluate the effectiveness of soil health practices in reducing the risk of downstream flooding following heavy rain events? Well, that's a very interesting one. Um, and I know you showed know that cover crop flood, slide. I know that a lot of floods have been attributed, you know, the severity of floods have often been attributed to poor soil management upstream, creating more runoff, more erosion, more sedimentation, et cetera. So I would think, you know, those flooded fields, if there's any slope to them all, they're running off into, you know, into the Delta region and, and uh, accentuating flooding. You know, now if you're in the receiving end of a flood, doesn't matter how good your cover crop is, if the, if the river floods your field, it floods your field. But again, healthy soil will drain out faster. Uh, and I've seen, I mean, we're blessed with a pretty healthy, deep, well-drained soil here. And there've been a couple of times that our river on our own land um, got out of its banks and came into the garden. And uh, within three days, I could work it with hand tools. It was drained out enough so that it was not muddy. And I asked one of the NRCS people about it and, and described it. And said, it's just amazing soil. And they said, oh yeah, you must have a coma loam and tends to build really good organic matter and have really high quality. Um, and an example of good stewardship that mitigated flood, we, our worst flood happened in, in September of 2015. It rained, it had been raining a lot. It rained 21 inches in a 21 day period. And seven of those came down on one of the days in the middle of that rainy spell. On that seven inch day, our river jumped its banks and was raging three feet deep through our community garden. We had dug our potatoes uh, about uh, six weeks earlier. And if you dig potatoes and leave the, leave the soil just turned up like that, and you get a flood like that, you're gonna have, you're gonna have a three foot gully. Well, one of my community mates uh, was right on the ball. The day those potatoes came out, he planted sorghum sedan grass. The day the flood came, the sorghum sedan was about four feet tall and solid. I mean, it's just like a complete solid mass of like, like that wheat field you saw on that slide. And it looked like we had roll crimped the cover crop, but we did not lose a single shovel full of soil. It was all there. And the rest of the garden, fortunately, was pretty much soddered over with, with perennial grasses and weeds and part of it was in sweet potatoes. So we didn't lose any soil because everything was covered. And that one really vulnerable corner that took the brunt of that raging river, um, that cover crop saved our, saved our whole field. Okay, um, there's someone else who has a question just about the presentation in general. Um, when you talk about organic farming practices, are you referring to certified organic farming only, or are you re referring in sort of a general sense to ecological growing practices? I know you mentioned a couple instances where somebody was not organic, but I assume that you were talking about certified organic farming when you mentioned organic. In your For the most part, yeah. and that is because, you know, and speaking, this is an organic farming research foundation, uh, and e-organic production. So right. yes, it's primarily aimed at that. The reason I mentioned these examples of conservation agriculture is to emphasize that there are certain practices that are of uh, leading importance in this picture. Uh, now, having said that, the important thing that organic, uh, certified organic offers is you are really staying away from all synthetics and by doing that, you really are protecting soil life. And there is evidence that even um, things like glyphosate or Roundup, which is not one of the most toxic chemicals out there, uh, at least it's to soil life, but repeated use of it will uh, reduce the soil biological activity. And in fact, there was one study where even a single application at normal use rates uh, cut mycorrhizal activity quite significantly. 
So that's a big plus. So the way I look at it is organic agriculture, uh, like remember the four principles, one of them was uh, minimize disturbance. Well, one way to minimize disturbance in an, if, you, if you're doing annual cropping, you can't eliminate disturbance. It's just gonna happen. If you, you, annual cropping is a different ecosystem from the forest, the prairie, the steppe, or even the desert that, that was there before. So uh, whatever you're doing to grow annual crops, something's gonna get modified. Um, in organic agriculture, what we do is we say, okay, we're not gonna do any synthetic chemicals. We wanna minimize chemical disturbance. And if we have to get out the tiller uh, to manage a cover crop or a weed, we'll do, but we're gonna be as careful as we can. The organic standards say that tillage practices must maintain or improve the physical, chemical, and biological condition of the soil. And that's a pretty high bar when you think about it because uh, tillage very often does at least temporarily expose the soil to more erosion, breaks up soil structure, kills off some of the fungi and the larger organisms. Um, so it's a big, steep challenge. Um, conservation agriculture uh, is a system that says absolutely no more physical disturbance, no more tillage, no matter what you're growing and use chemicals judiciously as little as possible, as much as necessary. What Gabe Brown does is conservation agriculture at its best. Um, so that's a slightly different approach. And the data show that both can sequester quite a bit of carbon and, and, it, and uh, are similarly effective. So I'm seeing a kind of a convergent evolution of the organic approach and the conservation agriculture approach to a point where you really have no significant physical or chemical disturbance. Uh, but yeah, most of these, I mean, cover cropping, uh, crop rotation, those are uh, the use of organic amendments. All of these things are practices held in common by conservation and organic systems. Uh, and yeah. you'll, yeah, the one thing I say is that I did not at any point specifically say, well, at this point you put on some Roundup because you don't want to disturb the soil. So that's why this is an organic presentation and not a conservation agriculture one. Okay, all right, that, that's great. Um, Megan, I just wanted to welcome you to say oh. anything else that you might want to add um, to this discussion Hi. about any aspect of <laughs> climate, climate mitigation and agriculture. Um, thanks. Um, I guess I've just been thinking of some of the, the themes that have come up throughout this talk. Um, and I think a lot of it um, has to do with um, not only trying to feed um, plants the nutrients they need, but also um, giving the microbes what they need. To, because in the long term, if you're going to really build up stable carbon, it needs to actually go through the microbes themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and the studies are showing that the carbon that's the oldest in the soil is actually um, like dead bodies of the microorganisms. And so making sure that, like you're saying, you're not applying um, chemicals that are killing off the life in the soil, um, but also making sure that, that there's like a balanced amount of carbon and nitrogen and other um, nutrients that are being added to the soil. So I think having like, definitely doing some soil testing, um, <clears throat> nutrient um, analysis on, on whatever farm you're at and, and getting a, a good um, measure across your farm because there's gonna be a lot of spatial variability can really help target what um, needs to be added and how much um, and getting impact on that. So I think it's about the biology of the soil, but then also these different amendments um, can help build structure to your soil. And so I think that has to do with the um, resilience of um, these, these soils to climate change because with better soil structure, you have more um, nutrient, long-term nutrient availability um, to be able to, and also water holding capacity. So during periods of drought, um, if you have better soil structure, um, that is going to help retain the moisture that is irrigated and applied. Um, and and also with flooding, the flooding question, um, without with having some having salinity problems, which are are common in in California, um, applying um, gypsum gypsum can help um, not only with like calcium deficiencies, but also with um, help mitigating salinity problems. Um, and when you do have 
saline soils, when you irrigate, sometimes the um, infiltration rates can be really um, diminished. And so you can have a lot of runoff um, when you have these problems with salinity. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. Um, that's an important point for the West, for sure. Um, so um, one final question we have time for here. Um, what are your thoughts on microbial diversity versus microbial technology, um, applying specific microbe species shown to target certain plant or soil life functions? That's what um, the questioner means by microbial technology. So do mm -hmm. either of you want to take that question? I'll let you shoot, go first, uh, Megan. Uh, well, I know that there are, um, you know, companies out here in, in the Bay Area um, that, that are selling, um, you know, inoculants um, to apply to soils and, and help um, build up the nutrients that your specific soil needs. Um, I'm not sure um, about the data on that and, and the most recent research, but I think it's definitely um, something a viable option. Um, and in terms of diversity, I think, I think it's important, but I think your soil um, will have a, what it needs as long as you're giving it um, the amendments that it needs and you can build up that um, diversity over time. Yeah, I would just add, uh, Gabe Brown said, um, if you build it, they will come. He did not use any microbial inoculants to bring about that uh, restoration of the, of the 5,000 acres of range. Mm -hmm. Thank you for all the question. As I mentioned, you'll be able to find the recording in about a week on the eOrganic YouTube channel. And you can also find all the presentation notes and slide handouts for the webinars for this series, along with the recordings, at the link on your screen. Thank you so much, Mark and Megan, and we hope you can all join us for the other webinars in this series, which you can find by typing webinars by eOrganic into a search engine. Thank you. Thank you.